Welcome to FiberStar Citrify Functional Benefits in Beverage Products webinar. We want to thank you for attending this session, and before we start, I'd like to review a few webinar training items. This webinar is muted to provide you the highest audio quality. This webinar will be recorded and available to you after the three sessions have been broadcasted. There will be four poll questions during the webinar, and these poll questions will be spread throughout the session, and answers to these poll questions will be shared to keep you informed about the market trends. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar. Please locate your question box, type directly into the box, and push Submit. These questions will be answered at the end of the session. And if you have additional questions, please contact your FiberStar Sales Manager, and we'll follow up with a response promptly. A survey will follow this webinar. Please take a moment to fill this out. We use your feedback to improve our future webinars. FiberStar has over 30 distributors globally. Some of these distributors have been partners with us for several years, while some distributors are brand new to Citrify. These webinars are purposely created for attendees, including distributors and customers, of all varying knowledge and experience levels. These sessions will continue to contain repeating material in addition to newly generated science and commercial successes. Now I'd like to introduce the webinar speakers today. The first speaker is me, Jennifer Stevens. I currently manage FiberStar's marketing and communications program. My 18-year tenure includes food applications research, market analysis, and marketing communications for water management ingredients such as starches, gums, and fibers sold into the human and pet food industries. Today I'll review a few trends affecting the beverage market. After sharing the market conditions, I'll briefly review the Citrify product line, which includes the 100, 125, 200, and 300 series. Our technical speaker today is Nisha Zelzny, a FiberStar Technical Sales Manager. Nisha's expertise resides in gums like alginates, pectins, CMC, xanthan and gel and gum used in beverages, dairy, salad dressings, sauces, and baking applications. Mrs. Elsney's extensive experience and knowledge within hydrocolis provides her the expertise in providing superior customer technical service and sales group support. So let's get started. Today we'll briefly recover the beverage segment trends in the Citrify portfolio. Next, Nisha will discuss Citrify's functional benefits and how those attributes affect beverage products. After that, she'll cover a varying beverage types such as neutral and acid pH beverages. In addition, other functionalities such as emulsification, clouding, and partial pulp replacement will be discussed. A summary and Q&A session will conclude the webinar. The beverage segment is affected by several trends. These trends vary by region and country. And one of the fastest growing trends is the clean label phenomena. Europe pioneered this trend by pushing for E-number free ingredients in GMO food products. This trend emerged with the U.S. and parts of Asia years later. The challenge with this trend is that clean label is not regulated and it's very subjective because it's based on the consumer's opinion. Multinational companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola have ramped up their efforts in creating products with cleaner labels, especially in the beverage area. Depending on the company's target market, clean label can mean removing negatively perceived ingredients that are chemical sounding or affiliated with health concerns. These ingredients could be, but not limit to, any of the water holding or texturizing ingredients like carrageenan, xanthan, methylcellulose, or modified starches. In the U.S., companies are actively removing carrageenan from beverages. The challenge is that they're looking for natural and highly functional replacements that are not widely available or do not provide the full functionality. Some companies define clean label as removing allergens such as soy, dairy, nuts, or wheat from their foods. This goes beyond the niche segments such as celiacs, gluten-free, or dairy-free. And in some regions, companies are defining and supporting their sustainable efforts. It's not uncommon for ingredient companies to now provide sustainable documentation as part of the consideration and approval process. Better for You is an ongoing trend in various countries. Depending on the country, there are now mandates that require products to be less in sugar or salt. For instance, in the U.S., a new labeling will go into effect that will highlight added sugars, which will affect beverages that are positioned to be better for you. 
In general, there's a segment of consumers globally that seek out more natural and healthier products. This can range from fiber enrichment to vitamin and mineral fortification. Lastly, cost savings is always an initiative with companies. Within this segment, we will mention cost in use and partial pulp replacement applications, which may provide cost savings depending on the region, market, and application. Now that we've reviewed some of the trends affecting the beverage segment, let's do a quick review of the FiberStar portfolio. FiberStar offers 10 product types differentiated by the composition and particle size. As you can see, these products can be used in various foods including meats, bakery, beverages, sauces, dressings, dairy, and other food products. The simplified matrix outlines the different product lines and their uses across various applications. All citrified products provide specific benefits within beverages. These will be covered in more in depth during the technical discussion. FiberStar maintains several quality certifications which may be applicable to your region. These certifications outlined here are available by way of digital or hard copy. Please contact your respective sales manager or the director of quality, Tasha Olson. Tasha's contact information will be available at the end of this presentation. We have come to our first poll question for today, so I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. The question is, what ingredients are you trying to replace or reduce in beverages? You can choose more than one answer if need be. Carrageenan, starches, gel and gum, xanthan gum, and or CMC. We have almost everyone voted, so I'm going to give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and let's take, it the, take a look at the results. So you can see here, the folks online at the webinar, are looking to replace Kerrigan and CMC in beverage products. And then shortly behind Xanthan gum is the next, the next replacement option. Thank you so much for participating. Now I'm going to hide this. Now that we're done with the poll question, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Nisha so she can talk about the science and applications. Thanks, Jenny, and welcome, everyone. Today, I hope to cover some of the ingredients and processes found in the beverage market and give you some ideas of where and how Citrify can be used in these systems. We're first going to do a review of the structure and function of Citrify. Citrify 100 products are the whole fiber from the pulp of the orange. The pulp is a byproduct of the orange juice industry, which has been pumped to our facility washed with water, run through our patented physical process to open up the fiber, then dried and milled. 97% of the water used in the, washing purpose, in the washing process goes back to the orange juice manufacturer and is recycled. This makes our process very eco-friendly and sustainable. This same process is repeated when we make our 125 products with peel rather than with pulp. The pictures to the left show what the pulp looks like as it comes into the plant. The incoming pulp is, a li is light cream in color and is smooth and silky to the touch. The picture to the right shows the fiber after processing and just how much the surface area is increased. This increased surface area gives Citrify strong water binding and emulsification properties. It is the unique structure and chemistry of Citrify that gives it the ability to bind oil and water together, giving it emulsification properties. This picture gives us some insight into the mechanism of emulsification with Citrify. To orient what you are seeing in this picture, anything green is insoluble fiber. 
The small blue dots are soluble pectin, and anything red is oil. For traditional emulsifiers, the red droplets would be discrete droplets surrounded by a phospholipid layer. In traditional emulsions, the prevention of fat agglomeration happens because the phospholipid layer prevents the oil droplets from contacting one another and agglomerating. In this picture, you can see that the opposite is happening. The oil is attached to the fiber, and the fiber is hanging onto that oil and water, physically keeping the oil droplets from contacting other oil droplets. The oil slides into striations and pockets on the surface of the fiber, as you can see right in here, and magnified right over here. This happens quite passively. The oil is quite happy to interact with the my, more hydrophobic portions of the pectin and residual protein in the citrified par particle. This means that a stable emulsion can be created without a lot of shear, as many of you have seen with our emulsion demo. The unique structure and chemistry of citrify also gives it great stability. This top graph shows that citrify is very stable over a wide temperature range. Citrify binds and holds water so well that it is freeze-thaw stable and cook stable as well. As you can see in the lower graph, citrify does not change viscosity much over the pH range of most foods, and it only increases slightly in basic conditions. This may be important if lye is used anywhere in your processing, like in the manufacture of corn tortillas or masa flour, or possibly in the manufacture of hummus products. Citrify is a natural product, and therefore natural viscosity variations occur. However, as a whole, the longer the fiber length, the greater the viscosity. This is due to flow resistance of the larger particle size. In this graph, the top dot here is Citrify 100. This is Citrify 100 FG, 140, and 100 M20. And you can see how the size of the particle influences the viscosity. Let's move on to beverages. The beverage market is incredibly varied. For discussion purposes, it is useful to classify beverages into pH range and protein content. This is what such a classification looks like graphically. Most neutral beverages contain protein, have a pH as close to 7 as possible, and have flavors like chocolate, vanilla, coffee, or possibly tea. There has been a surge of vegetarian milks here in the U.S. with novel ingredients such as hemp, cashew, this is not new for Brazilians, but new here in the States, and, and several new milk products from the fava bean family. These join coconut, almond, and soy milks already popular here and globally. As we move down the pH, down in pH, past the isoelectric point of protein, more fruit-flavored beverages start making an appearance. Interest in probiotics has begun to increase the popularity of yogurt and kefir beverages. These have a pH of around 4.2. They contain live active cultures and are seen as a healthy source of good bacteria. Protein fortified juice beverages or acidified milk products have a pH of approximately 3.5 to about 3.8. These are made by stabilizing the protein with pectin or CNC and slowly dropping the pH to the desired endpoint. Simple juice beverages fall between 2.8 and about 3.6 for less acidic beverages, depending on the flavor. And finally, carbonated beverages can fall in the 2.8 range. The first type of beverage we're going to cover are neutral pH beverages. As mentioned before, these tend to be milk or protein beverages from other sources, such as nuts or legumes, as well. And then they have flavors such as chocolate, coffee, or possibly tea, dairy milks. These have a pH as close to 7 as possible. 
Stabilizers for these systems need to be able to suspend protein and other ingredients such as cocoa or titanium dioxide. The stabilizing system also needs to help protect protein during processing as well as emulsify any fat in the system. It, all, it needs to do all of these technical things and also impart a nice mouthfeel and have a neutral flavor. That's not asking much, right? Here's a look at some of the ingredients manufacturers are currently using. For flavored milk products, carrageenan is generally king. Use levels are low, between 0.02% to 0.06%, and it does a great job suspending cocoa and other ingredients when used correctly. Carrageenan can be a bit tricky to work with as dosing is dependent on several factors, such as fat content, cocoa concentration, milk protein content, the quality of the milk protein, and processing. The dosage threshold is quite narrow, and if all the factors aren't taken into account, it's quite easy to under or overdose the carrageenan. However, once these are dialed in, carrageenan makes a great milk product. It easily suspends cocoa by forming a fluid gel network with milk proteins and gives a very clean mouthfeel. Unfortunately, thanks to suspect science being widely quoted on the internet, carrageenan is fast falling out of favor for manufacturers, but this is making way for other ingredients such as gel and gum. Hyacyl gel and gum is becoming more and more common in the states as carrageenan falls out of favor. Use levels are also low for this product. They range from between 0.025% to 0.035 percent, and gelin is the less dependent on factors such as fat or protein levels than carrageenan is. Again, the dose, dosage threshold is quite narrow for gel and gum. Gel and gum systems with locust bean gum or other emulsifiers have become very popular within the U.S. beverage industry. Carboxymethylcellulose with microcrystalline cellulose are commonly used in neutral dairy beverages. These cellulosics form 3D networks that are more heat stable and more common in temperate areas where chilling before filling is difficult. They are generally used for processing stability and to give mouthfeel to the finished product. Cellulo cellulosics do not form a complex structure with proteins, so dosing is generally a little bit more straightforward than with carrageenan. Locust bean gum and guar gum are also found in neutral protein beverages. Neither of these are suspending agents. They are generally present to give mouthfeel to the beverage. Mono and diglycerides are not commonly used in beverages in the U.S., but they can be found in beverages internationally. These are used to help emulsify any pr fat present in the beverage. For plant-based milks, carrageenan is again still widely used. Different fractions of carrageenan or more iota-type carrageenan is effective in these beverages. However, carrageenan has recently been removed from the NOSB list, so it is no longer considered suitable for organic food in the U.S. markets. This is again making way for other ingredients such as gel and gum to be used. Other ingredients such as cellulosics, xanthan and guar are used for mouthfeel. Safflower or soy lecithin are commonly used to emulsify any fats in these milks. Let's take a look at processing and stabilizer selection. Perhaps the most prevalent method for processing neutral beverages is UHT or HTSD methods. I'll give you a closer look at this process in a minute, but let's talk about which stabilizers can be used with this system. For this method, the liquid and dry ingredients are blended, preheated, homogenous. As the deposit temperature is below 25 degrees Celsius, carrageenan is entirely appropriate. As we noted before, cellulosic systems and gel and gum systems are also great with this method of processing. As you may know, both carrageenan and gel and gum require higher temperatures to hydrate, 
which UT, UHT and HTST processing provides plenty of. Gel and gum may be slightly easier to work with in that its set temperature is much higher than carrageenan and therefore does not require the cooler deposit temperatures. So it may not require a secondary chiller to be in place as carrageenan may. The next common type of processing is retort processing. CNC, the cellulose 6 or pectin are your choice, choices for this method. Currently, retort processing is, is used mainly for shelf-stable Starbucks Frappuccino beverages in glass bottles here in the United States. Pectin is generally the only stabilizer used in this coffee beverage. Neither carrageenan nor gelan can be used for this processing because they both need to be sheared past their set point to form stable fluid gels. Pectin will stabilize the protein during heating to 250C under pressure. We had a customer successfully use Citrify in this area for a Thai coffee that he was working on. This was a coffee beverage whitened with sweetened condensed milk and quite delicious, I am sure. Finally, most instant beverages or coffee whiteners are spray dried. These generally contain maltodextrin as a carrier and texturizers such as xanthan gum, CMC, or carrageenan. The, the gums need to be rapidly soluble to quickly provide viscosity and some suspension of solids while the beverage is being consumed. This is a diagram of UHT or HTST processing. The temperatures quoted in here are for UHT processing. Dry ingredients are blended together to get a good dispersion of the hydrocolloids. The dries are then added to the liquid and blended. These are pumped to the pasteurizing unit where the, the liquid is preheated. We recommend for most gel and gum beverages to heat to approximately 88 degrees Celsius. The liquid is then homogenized to stage, and we recommend 1500 PSI first stage and 500 PSI second stage. Then the final heat heats the temperature, heats the liquid up for about four and a half seconds to very, very hot temperatures. Then, if you're working with carrageenan, you need to cool below 25 degrees Celsius and fill. If you're not working with carrageenan, then you don't need to cool to that cool temperature. Here's a look at the USDA pasteurization requirements for milk products. There are not many beverages, beverage companies using batch pasteurization anymore, but it is occasionally used for ice cream-based manufacturing. As we talked about before, carrageenan is a great and functional ingredient because it forms loose networks with casein. It is especially efficient for milk-based systems. However, if you want to take a look at any of these links listed below, there are links to articles that are condemning carrageenan as being unsafe and causing sickness in people, which is what's making most manufacturers look outside of carrageenan to be able to suspend particulates in their beverages. There are not many options out there that suspend particulates without adding a lot of viscosity, and there are not many that are as efficient as carrageenan. One of the very few is high acyl gel and gum. At low use levels, it forms a very stable fluid gel network. The picture to the left is a stylized look at, at this fluid gel network. One problem with this fluid gel network is that it will tighten up over time. This means that the long chains of the molecules will entangle with themselves and interact more strongly. When this happens, the fluid gel network contracts and this pushes water out of the system. Citrify is a great ingredient to provide spacing between the long chains of gelin making it physically impossible for the network to contract, and that is represented in the picture to the right. There are some other manufacturers who are offering blends of gelin and other network spacer ingredients, such as locust bean gum or emulsifiers like gum arabic. 
Citrify is a great, all-natural, non-GMO, no e-number alternative to these ingredients. Citrify is also very price stable, where many other ingredients have had wide swings in pricing in the past few years. Fiberstar has conducted two studies so far on the viability of Citrify Gelin blends in neutral pet protein beverages. The first one we'll talk about is one we did late last year. We took a look at protein-fortified chocolate milk. We used kappa carrageenan as a control, and we varied the added protein from about 1 to 1.5% 1 whey protein fortification. For the experimentals, we varied the protein at 1 or 1.5%. 1 the gel end level was 0 0.028 or 0.03%, and the citrify was 0.3 or 0.5%. Altogether, we ran about 13 samples during this run. With the variations, we were able to look at the effect of gel end concentration or citrify concentration, as well as protein concentration on the overall stability and viscosity of the beverage. We also did a vegan version of chocolate milk using pea protein, so we were able to look at the effective protein source as well. This is a look at the basic formulation with the variations we just talked about. And here's a look at the results. The far left samples in each photo, here and here, are actually the carrageenan control samples. Do you have any idea why they don't look so great? Unfortunately, the microthermics unit at the University of Minnesota does not have a secondary chiller, and we believe that the exit temperature for these products was too high. Carrageenan formed a, does what it, carrageenan does really well, and that is it formed a great complex with the protein in this system, and unfortunately, it gelled. The gel and gum does not do this. And this demonstrates at a glance why gel and gum, a gel and gum system may be easier to work with. With this study, we were able to confirm that Citrify does indeed act as a network spacer. This was apparent because for both the low protein level at 1% or the high protein level at 1.5%, the samples with the Citrify, with the higher Citrify, concentration actually had slightly lower viscosity. This seems counterintuitive unless you remember that the network spacing Citrify provides reduces the ability of gel and gum to associate with itself, and this lowers the viscosity. Here's a look at the viscosity results. Note that the 0.5% that the Citrify has a slightly lower viscosity than the sample with 0.3%. This indicates that higher levels of Citrify may give gel end dosage tolerance. Because the dosage threshold for gel end is quite narrow, addition of Citrify is a great tool to help formulators not overdose the gel end in the system. With the higher amounts of Citrify, the dosage of gel end may not need to be as tightly dialed in as it would with the lower amounts. Here's a look at the results for the vegan chocolate beverage. Note that the carrageenan sample to the far left is stable. This is because there aren't any caseins for the carrageenan to react with, which means that deposit temperature is a little less important for this system. At 0.028% gel -an, both citrify levels were stable and both beverages were very palatable. Here's a look at the effective protein source on the viscosity. The samples with milk protein had higher viscosity than the samples with vegan protein. This indicates that there is room for optimization depending on the protein source. We only have time to touch on a few of the highlights of this study. If you are interested in the re entire report, please contact us. Next, we're going to move on to coffee or tea and milk beverages. <clears throat> Milk-based coffee beverages typically contain 40% milk, which automatically makes carrageenan the less effective choice for these types of beverages, as carrageenan is generally most efficient for full milk products. Again, Citrify and Gelan blends are recommended for carrageenan replacement in these systems. 
Citrify provides a nice creamy mouthfeel while stabilizing the fluid gel system. Coffee and tea are quite acidic and can denature milk proteins while UHT processing. In general, keep the pH above 6.5. Most manufacturers use a phosphate salt such as trisodium phosphate to achieve this. Typical gel end levels will be around 0.028% and Citrify can be varied from 0.1 to 0.5% depending on the desired mouthfeel. Let's take a look at a couple of commercial examples. These contain gel end gum along with locust bean gum to stabilize them. This is the retorted beverage offered by Starbucks that I mentioned earlier. It is stabilized with pectin. Here's a look at the formulation for the study that we did. For this study, we kept the gel and gum stable at 0.028%, and we looked at different grind sizes of Citrify, including 140 and 120. We also wanted to take a look at Citrify 125 and 40 in this system. The viscosity results indicate that in this 40% milk system, Citrify does increase the viscosity of the beverage slightly over the gel and control. The beverages with Citrify had a nice creamy mouthfeel. The tasters noted that the flavor of the sample made with, with Citrify 125 M40 had a stronger coffee note, and many preferred this over the samples with 140 or 120. But all the tasters really enjoyed how creamy the addition of Citrify made this beverage. To summarize a few of the benefits Citrify brings to neutral, ready-to-drink beverages, Citrify will improve the cons consistency, stability, and texture of fluid gel systems. It imparts a nice, creamy mouthfeel with a natural body. Citrify has no e-number and is very la label-friendly in most parts of the world. It is easy to work with in that it is easy to hydrate and it is easy to stabilize with other suspending agents like gel and gum. It helps to stabilize gel and gum fluid gel systems by acting as a network spacer. Thank you for your attention so far. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to Jenny who has a poll question for you. Thanks, Nisha. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to submit the second poll question for today. The second poll question is, is carrageen replacement in beverages a trend or are your customers asking for this in your region? Yes, no, or maybe you're not sure. So I'm going to give a couple more seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and let's take a look at the results. So it looks about 60% say that care game replacement is not a trend going on at this time, which makes sense because this webinar is actually mostly Asia and Australia and New Zealand. Okay, thank you so much for participating in this poll. I'm going to go ahead and hide this and I'm going to hand this off to Nisha so she can continue on with the technical session. Thanks, Jen. Now we're going to move on to lower pH beverages. If you'll recall, beverages in this category are juice drinks, acidified protein drinks, drinkable yogurts or kefir, smoothies, and carbonated drinks. Stabilizers are used to improve, add mouthfeel, or suspend pulp, suspend or protect protein, add acid stability to proteins, 
And finally, to emulsify flavor oils or fats. Ingredients used to emulsify or weight flavor oils or fats are ester gum, gum arabic, brominated vegetable oil, and lecithin. Brominated vegetable oil is not allowed in most of the world except in the U.S. Someday we'll catch up with you guys. Currently, a lot of these gums are hidden on the label. They are part of the natural and artificial flavor system used in carbonated citrus beverages. But legislation is slowly changing in the U.S., and this may not be allowed in the future. With its emulsification properties, Citrify may offer a clean alternative to these gums. Moving on, acidified protein drinks are generally stabilized with pectin. CMC has also been shown to be an effective option. And finally, most juice beverages that are labeled fruit juice are 100% juice and not stabilized. In the U.S., we have some cocktail mixers that do contain cellulosic or xanthan gum. Stabilizers and texturizing ingredients are a little bit more common internationally in this market segment. We'll quickly cover dry mix beverages first. These beverages are typically spray dried and possibly agglomerated to make them more readily dispersible. Citrify can give some formulators some choices that may not have been available before. Citrify can replace gum arabic or ester gum, which are used to stabilize the emulsion prior to spray drying. It may be possible to formulate a simple beverage with flavor oil plated directly onto Citrify. We will feature an example of this in a few slides. Processing of ready-to-drink type of beverages varies widely and according to pH and protein content. These can be carbonated, hot filled, or processed using high pressure with colder temperatures. We will attempt to uh, cover a few of these processes. Let's take a look at the spray drying process. The product starts out as a liquid. With the oil, proteins, if present, and plenty of maltodextrin and emulsifier. This solution is generally run through a high pressure homogenizer. And then it's pumped through nozzles that sp spray a fine mist into the drying chamber. This liquid dries very quickly and then falls to the bottom of the dryer where it is run through some sort of a particle sorter or fit sifter. The key for spray drying is to get that initial liquid in as high a solids as possible. This solution needs to have a low enough viscosity to make it through the spray drying nozzles. The liquid should be reasonably stable so that the finished dry material is homogenous. This is typically where emulsifiers like lecithin or gum arabic are used. Here's a look at the most successful formulations we ran during a study that we did of spray drying. The typical gum use level of gum arabic is rather high at 7%. Gum arabic has great functionality and does not contribute much viscosity, so it's very commonly used for spray drying applications where solids matter. However, with Citrify, you can use much less of the expensive gum and more inexpensive maltodextrin. If you'll notice the different oil loads, these samples were the most successful runs made during this study, and they were not necessarily designed to be at parity. Check out the particle size distribution achieved with Citrify. We had a very nice, even, bell-shaped distribution, and we were able to get this about the same average particle size as what we were able to get with gum arabic. I would like to quickly mention here that while Citrify works well emulsifying the base of spray dry beverages or whiteners, it may be even more economical to formulate a dry mix using oil plated onto Citrify and then simply dry blended with other dry ingredients. 
Keep this option in mind. In a few slides, we'll share a simple beverage using plated lemon oil. This slide showcases a few of the dry mix beverages available from around the world and in the U.S. These dry mixes contain lecithin, such as the country time here, gum arabic or gum arab or gum acacia such as this beverage here or, or blends of the different emulsifiers all of these emulsifying ingredients are ingredients that could potentially be replaced with citrify especially in these types of dry mix beverages the current pricing for these gums in addition to their use levels may put Centrify at a cost advantage in these beverages. This may be particularly true if formulators can remove other clouding agents or mouthfeel enhancers by using Citrify instead. Keep in mind that spray drying is not only used for fruit beverages, but it is also used extensively for dry coffee whiteners, dietary shakes, hot cocoa mixes, and a wide variety of other beverages. Citrify's thermostability, function, functionality, and fiber content give formulators a multifaceted tool to make high-quality, clean-label beverages. We're moving on to the demonstration of our lemon beverage. This initial slide shows the flavor base. This is a 20% load, but our studies have shown that it is possible to get up to a 25% load and still have a, flo a flowable powder. I got lemon oil from my local candy making shop. I usually just dri drizzle the oil onto the citrify directly and then I blend with the fork as best I can. This could be a lot more efficient, efficiently mixed using a small blender or a small food processor but this demo, this demo showcases how easy it is to, flate, to plate a flavor oil. Approximately one gram of the base is then added to the sweetener and mixed with a little citric acid and salt. I dry blend these ingredients together in a sandwich bag. I then rip off the corner and pour it into a, a bottle of water. The resulting beverage is a great looking lemonade and it has a very natural pulpy texture and cloud. Here's a series of concentrations demonstrating the cloud that Citrify can give to a beverage. Please note that these will eventually separate out if there's no other spending agent present. We're going to move on to hot fill beverages. Most juices found in glass bottles are processed with this method. This slide shows the USDA requirements for processing high acid or low pH foods. For hot filling beverages, the dry ingredients, if there are any, are blended into water. The beverage is run through a plate heat exchanger and filled directly into heat stable packaging such as glass bottles. The bottles are then, are then allowed to cool to ambient temperature and then palletized. Different manufacturers have different methods of cooling, but the temperatures listed here should give shelf stability when allowed to cool at ambient temperature. At this point, I'm going to hand off to Jenny, who has one more poll question for you. Another Thanks. one. Thanks, Nisha. I'm going to go ahead and share our third poll question for the day. And the poll question is, in what beverages does settling or separation matter to your customers? You can choose more than one answer. Smoothies, drinkable yogurts, protein drinks, juice drinks, carbonated or soda drinks, powdered concentrated drinks, or teas or coffees. Well, we have almost everyone voted, so I'm going to give a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and let's take a look at the results. 
So as you can see, it looks like your customers are very concerned about settling in the smoothies, drinkable yogurts category, as well as the juice drinks. Thanks for participating. So I'm going to hand this off back to Nisha so she can finish up the technical. Thanks, Jen. Next, we're going to explore drinkable yogurts and acidified milk beverages. Drinkable yogurts typically have live active cultures and a pH of around, of around 4.2. With the right culture, the proteins are denatured homogeneously, which gives the beverage a nice, creamy, and smooth texture. Citrify will help stabilize the protein and give the smooth, creamy texture to the drinkable yogurt. Here is the basic process for drinkable yogurts. Stabilizers are mixed with any other dry ingredients. These are blended into the raw milk. The milk is preheated, which begins to open up the milk proteins. The mixture is then homogenized and it's pasteurized. After pasteurization, the milk is cooled to inoculation temperatures, which falls around 42 to 45 degrees Celsius. After after the milk is then inoculated, two things can happen here. The milk can be that pasteurized or that that cultured and cultured in a large container and then packed off once the right pH is hit, or it can be inoculated and filled and then allowed to culture in the containers. Either way, the milk is held at about 42 degrees Celsius for between four and six hours. Citrify is currently being used in a commercial Lassi product here in the U.S. Lassi is a salted mint drinkable yogurt that's very popular in the Middle East and in the Philippines. We've recently also had success in Asia in drinkable yogurts. We'd really like to congratulate our Asian team for the win. Acidified milk or protein-fortified juice is a different beast entirely. These beverages typically have a pH of 3.8 or lower, which is much lower than the isoelectric points of protein. This means that the proteins must be stabilized. This is especially crucial during heat processing. Typically, pectin is used in these products, but CMC, CMCs have also been su successfully used. The prevailing theory is that the negatively charged portions of the pectin molecule interact with the positively charged acidified protein, and this forms the protective layer around the protein. These coated proteins are prevented from connecting or agglomerating by that fuzzy pectin layer. The crucial thing to note here during this process is that acidification should happen prior to any heat st step. If possible, I encourage manufacturers who are using dried protein sources to homogenize two times to reduce the average particle size of the protein. That would be here. So you would dry blend your dry ingredients and you would disperse into milk or water with your protein. And then you would pump to the homogenizer and then bring back and then acidify, and then run it through the regular processing. Typical levels of pectin are about 0.4 to 0.6 percent. Today, to date, we have only had partial success with directly acidified milk with 0.9 percent citrify 140. This le level partially stabilized the beverage, which is unusual as these beverages have cataclysmic failure if the protein isn't stabilized. But it may be possible to use Citrify to extend pectin or improve the mouthfeel and make a, make a creamier beverage with a pectin-stabilized acidified milk. Let's move on to a growing international trend. Fresh pressed juices and smoothies are very popular globally, but recently food scientists have, been made, have made getting fresh juices and smoothies to the market easier. 
HPP processing is not exactly new, but it has only recently gained popularity with, increasing, with the increasing popularity of cold-pressed juices. These are juices that have never been heated, so the fresh flavor and nutritional benefits are left intact. These juices on their own would have a very short shelf life, but when combined with HPP, manufacturers are achieving a much better shelf life. For processing, for this processing method, the juices are pressed, bottled into plastic bottles, and then run through a high pressure chamber that subjects the bottles to about 6,000 atmospheres of pressure. This high pressure inactivates most of the vegetative bacteria, giving a 60-day shelf life for low pH foods. As you can imagine, these high-value beverages are all extremely clean label, and Citrify can help manufacturers extend expensive pulp while also delivering a natural and pulpy texture. Formulators have the option of several different grind sizes to help them achieve their desired texture while still remaining clean label. If guar or xanthan gum is not an issue for your developers, Citrify 200 or 300 are great options. The last area we'll touch on is pulp extension. I've included a few photos of products that could benefit from pulp extension with Citrify. Citrify is a great way to extend expensive fruit pulp while maintaining the mouthfeel and functionality of pulp. This is an example of a mango beverage. The control has 35% mango pulp. For the experimental, the mango pulp was re reduced to 30% with a 0.4% added Citrify and an additional 5% water. I'm rounding here slightly. The resulting beverage had a sensory profile very similar to the full mango control with, slightly, with a slightly more perceived pulpiness and body. Again, if other hydrocolloids are not a problem, Citrify 200 and 300 are also great tools for pulp extension. Let's summarize the benefits of using Citrify in beverage applications. Citrify is a great tool to improve the consistency, stability, and texture of gel and gum fluid gels in ready-to-drink beverages. It can also deliver a great natural cloudiness and mouthfeel or a pulpiness to juice drinks. As always, Citrify is a non-GMO, no E-number, label-friendly ingredient. It is heat and acid stable which makes it very easy to incorporate a, in a large number of different beverage applications and utilizing different processing methods. Citrify is a natural emulsifier, which makes it a great addition to plant-based milks. Thank you so much for attending today, and I hope you found the information useful. We know that we have been given, we've given you a lot of information today. This beverage world can be complex and intimidating, if you would like any more information on anything that you've heard today, please contact us. And I'm going to hand this back to Jenny now. Thanks, Nisha. We have one more poll question before we go to the M to the Q&A piece of this webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and submit it. And the poll question is, what processing techniques are your customers most interested in using? Traditional pasteurization, retort, high pressure processing, pulse electric field, omic. we have everybody voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and let's take a look at the results. So it looks like the most popular process being used out there is a traditional pasteurization and then followed 
sort of shortly behind the retort process. Thank you so much for participating. So this concludes today's session. I'd like to thank you once again for attending today's webinar. Please contact your FiberStar sales manager if you have additional questions. And also, please feel free to contact other team members, if need be, by using the contact information listed on the slide. We're going to move into the Q&A. We are coming up to an hour now, so I'll take a couple questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. And if we do end up running out of time before the hour is up, a five-star sales manager or technical service will follow up with you in regards to your inquiries. So we'll go ahead and take the first question. So the question is, what beverage applications do you recommend using Citra 5100 versus 200 versus 300? Well, that's a great question. Citrify 100 products are generally safe to use across the board, but with our 200 and 300 line, it's best to remember that both xanthan and guar will react with protein at lower pH levels. So we don't recommend the use of 200 or 300 in low pH protein fortified beverages or drinkable yogurts. If the pH is low and no protein is present, Citrify 200 or 300 are good options, especially for pulp extension. Thank you, Nisha. I have another question. Can Citrify replace pectin in beverages? Well, this is a great question. We have had a, success, um, a retort coffee beverage successfully done with Citrify. Um, and so I, I would recommend taking a look at it for that purpose. Um, in, and in drinkable yogurts, yes, I think that it would be a great option, and I think it will give an even better mouthfeel than a pectin, traditional pectin stand, stabilized drinkable yogurt. Acidified milk is where things can get a little tricky. As I mentioned before, um, at 0.9%, we almost stabilized the beverage, and I've never seen that before. <laughs> I've only ever seen your, you either have a stable beverage or you've made cheese with the protein completely agglomerated at the bottom, and that was not the case here. So I suspect that it can be done. We just haven't quite figured out use levels yet. Okay, thanks, Nisha. I have another question. What type of beverages are using the HPP process? Well, those are the smoothie beverages and fresh pressed juices. They are all the rage right now, especially on the west coast of the United States where I live and where Jen does too. They're in all of the markets and it's pretty amazing to see and taste these amazing fresh, fresh tasting juices. And so those are the main products being that are utilizing this. And I've also seen baby food processed with this um, in those flexible pouches. So those are a couple of the products that I've seen using this kind of processing. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Uh, so when you're using Citrify in beverages, how is Citrify typically labeled? Or what can you use for labeling? Typically, it's just labeled as citrus fiber. Okay. I think that's the safest way to label it across the board. But you're going to have to consult with your labeling experts in your countries. Okay. And looks like I have one more question. Is Citrify 125 recommended for any beverage applications? I'm glad you asked. Um, as we talked about with that coffee beverage, the Citrify 125 product actually had a stronger coffee note. And a lot of the people who regularly drink coffee really noted that it was a better flavor. The residual flavonoids that are in Citrify 125, I think, make it a really nice choice for chocolate or coffee-flavored beverages. Okay. Actually, we had another question just popped in when you were talking. Um, can you use Citrify to totally replace CMC in a drinkable yogurt? Yes. If 
the drinkable yogurt is not a UHT processed. Um, so if it has live active culture, then absolutely. If it's a UHT process, that's where we get into that kind of tricky area. Okay. Well, that concludes our webinar. I want to remind everybody to take the survey on the way out because it does help us improve our webinars in the future. And with that, I want to say thank you and have a great day. Thank you, everybody.